Hello, everybody. Uh, this talk will be uh, can be a very short one. All you need to do is go to whatever Erlang project you're working on, grab your river config file, add that uh, project plugin, and run river 3 hang. As a matter of fact, I recommend you to do it right now so you start getting warnings during my presentation. And we can use the fact that you're all sitting in front of a computer. So by the end of it, you can ask me any questions about any of the warnings that Han will probably raise about your code. But if you want to understand what's going on with your projects while you run River 3 Han, just keep this talk in a second screen. You don't need to see my face, but you, you will be hearing what I'm talking about and while I explain the process of building this tool and also what it does and why we think it's useful. So let's start by introducing myself. I am that guy with a couple of more kilos due to the pandemic. And, uh, and I am a developer from Argentina. I've been part of the Erlang community for more than a decade already. And currently, I am a member of the Education Working Group at the Erlang Ecosystem Foundation. And uh, I work for Nextra, as Stavros said. And uh, in Nextro, we have this tradition of uh, twice a year spending a whole week doing, doing whatever we want uh, in development terms. So we have uh, five days to develop whatever we think it's worth. And uh, in 2019, we developed uh, one of the Erlang formatters. And in 2020, I joined these, uh, these two fellows. And I promise they are out of prison now. Uh, we, we worked together to create a new tool, which is called uh, Hank, and which is what I will show you in a minute. These two guys, by the way, are Pablo Brudnik and Diego Galero from uh, Ficus. So before we dive deep into Hank, let's take a broader look. Um, in development, in software development in general, but uh, also in Erlang in particular, there are many ways that you can include dev code in your uh, project. The larger the project, the more likely it is to have dev code. But uh, what is dev code? Dev code is uh, a piece of code that is not actually needed for uh, the production version of your application. And it comes in many ways. One of them is uh, unreachable code. You have code that uh, is, uh, is in functions or modules or whatever that uh, there is no way for any code path to go through it. The code is compiled and deployed, and it lives there, but nobody uses it, and it's never run. Uh, there is dead store, which are uh, variables that hold values that are not used. Usually, the Erlang compiler will uh, give you a warning about them. But at the same time, for Erlang, if, if you stretch a little bit the definition, you can also have stuff in ETS tables that you don't use, for instance. So that would be that store as well. Then you have redundant code, which is a code that uh, runs multiple times when it could have uh, run just once. If somebody is uh, watching the Erlang questions mailing list recently, you will see that uh, Richard Carson uh, introduced uh, or try to introduce a pinning operation to figure out when a variable is uh, unnecessarily matched again. And that kind of thing, when the code works, it's, uh, it leads to redundant code because it's uh, doubly assigned. And the second assign is not necessary. There are many other examples, but this talk is not about them. This talk is about the last uh, classification here, Oxbow code. And, uh, and I'm, uh, I like it in particular because it has a, a very funny story behind the name. Let me show you. So there was once two oxes, right? And somebody wanted to put them together to carry a plow through the field. And so they created the oxbow. The oxbow is a bow, the, the U-shaped thing that you see there connected to the wooden part that goes around the neck of the ox to carry the plow. All right, and so later on, 
geologists came around and found that some rivers bend and touched again and at, the, at some point when they touched when they reconnect they left a piece of the river forming a lake in an oxbow shape like a long elongated u and at some point some developers figured out that at some for certain uh, software uh, pieces they had code that uh, bend in a way and reconnect to itself leaving some external tools that are no longer part of the main flow but they still live there like the oxbow lake so they call it oxbow code oxbow code is the code that's left behind when you rem remove or change some functionality and you don't remove everything you leave something uh, behind you and if you wonder what that something can be okay let me show you a story so you understand Let's say you have a, a module within a large application. You have a module like this that has a run function that basically just evaluates a, a function and logs the result. No big deal. It, it's tested, so it works, and it's fine. And your boss asks you to uh, add sampling to it. So basically, what the what the requirement entails is that not always the function should evaluate the parameter, it sometimes should ignore it. So uh, you go and add a parameter to specify that sample rate to your application. And you call it sample rate, of course. And then you go and extend your test cases to include the case where uh, it has to be ignored, like this. You set the sample rate to 0. And in that case, it should be ignored. If you set the sample rate to one, uh, it should be evaluated. Of course, the test break as expected. And so you fix the code by reading the sample rate parameter from the application. And since application get M has a, 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 a allows you to define a default value in case the parameter is not there, you add a macro for that uh, matching number. And you use that value to figure it out how uh, or when to evaluate and when not to evaluate. When we have that kind of functionality, we usually call those functions maybe whatever, right? So instead of evaluate, now it goes maybe evaluate based on the sample rate. And to comply with the restriction of the sample rate, we use the, the done best way possible, which is we compute a uniform value. And if it's larger than the rate, it will be ignored. Done. The test pass and everybody is happy. The system keeps growing. You leave the company. Some other people come comes along. They leave the company and so on until another version of you comes along and finds this ticket. We need to remove the sampling from lab. And as you can see, there are no references to the. It's not like you can go and uh, revert the commit where you added the sampling. So. You have to remove it. You get the module and you have to remove it. So again, test driven development. We no longer need to ignore anything and we don't need uh, to adjust the sample rate. And so we can just remove those things and uh, the test will break, of course, randomly, but still. And so to make the test work, we remove the part where we return ignore. And ta -da! no longer sampled, right? But as you can see on the screen, uh, the code is clearly not the same as it was before. But it does the same thing, right? It works in the same way. What happens? Well, you uh, implemented the change without knowing the origin of everything else. And that's something that happens every single time. Like, all the time it happens especially in larger systems managed by people that keeps changing with a lot uh, with a high uh, rotation so uh, somebody can review your changes and figure out like have a, they have a keen eye here and they see hey these two parameters are not actually necessary 
you are ignoring them in all versions of maybe evaluate uh, three. So you can remove them. Okay, but if you remove them, that function is no longer necessary because it will be calling evaluate. The only thing is it will be doing is passing the value along to evaluate. So, so you can just remove the function and remove the code that calls that function. And there you go, uh, less computation. So improvement in performance, very good. We remove that and the system works and we remove a little piece of uh, dev code from it. But then again, when, once you see this code and even the compiler will tell you that you're not using sample rate. And you can remove sample rate, but then again, maybe evaluate will only call evaluate. So you can just remove sample rate entirely and remove maybe evaluate entirely. Beautiful. Now you have an unused variable, sample rate. So you can remove that variable too and get a much more beautiful code. But if you are looking very uh, closely, you will see that we still have Oxbow uh, code instances. We still have stuff that's left there that doesn't uh, have any impact in production and we don't really need, like this one. We have a macro that nobody uses, so we can remove that macro. But also, if you remember, there are stuff, there is a stuff in other files unrelated in principle to this one with uh, stuff that we don't need anymore. This uh, configuration value for the application. So we can remove that thing. And now we are going back to where we started and we, pro we completely remove everything. We have less code and it's far easier to maintain. If that's so, the question is, why don't we do that from the very beginning if we are asked to remove things? And the answer, is usually in a form of a question. The developer might be uh, might might know that this uh, macro is not used anymore. In this in this case, it's simple. But what if the file is larger, or what if the the macro is in an include file in a header file? To verify that the macro is not used anywhere, it has to check in the entire code base, and not even that. If this is a library they have to be sure that nobody using this library is using that macro. Very complex. What about this one? Yeah, we are not longer consuming sample rate here, but uh, what about it? somewhere else? You have to traverse the whole code base and figure out if sample rate is used where and how, and if it's no longer needed. And if you are like a lazy developer like myself and you choose a, a lazy name like sample rate, good luck to you. So uh, these two parameters are clearly unused, but can they easily be removed? Yeah, here, this is a non-exported function that, that is only called once in the module. Yeah, over here it's easy. But in general, you have to check that it, this is not a callback, that this is not a if stub, that this is a, a, this function is not exported and used somewhere else or by some users of your library if you're de developing a library, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So basically, why don't we delete everything when we delete the functionality? Because we don't know. We don't know if we can, and it's generally safer to keep this stuff that even if it doesn't do anything at least it doesn't break anything uh, than removing it. Over time, this piles up. And by the end of this presentation, you will see that for large projects, the number of unnecessary uh, code pieces is really, really large. So we had some of those large projects. And so we wanted to remove those things. And to that, we created a tool called Hank. We call it Hank particularly because of that. We wanted to kill that code with fire. So since we are the same people that created the uh, River 3 format and also Elvis and some other tools, this tool shares the same um, uh, characteristics with them. It's extensible, so we 
we determine some rules that that uh, specify Oxbow code instances, but you can create your own. It's configurable, so you can you can clearly specify what you want to check and how and where. And in particular for this tool, it's accurate. I will explain more about that in a second. So what does Hank do for you? Hank in version 1.0, actually it's in version 1.1 that was released uh, yesterday, but it's the same. It can detect and use record fields. So you have a, you define the record with many fields, and then use one of those fields uh, you stop using, you don't need it anymore, and it stayed in the record. And it goes around every time you create the record, but you don't need it. So Han will tell you that you can remove it. The the original rule, which is uh, unused macros, you have a macro that's not used anywhere, so you don't need it. It will tell you if you have uh, header files that you don't include anywhere. It will tell you if you have configuration options in sysconfig files or in an application uh, environment that you don't consume anywhere. It will tell you if you have functions where, all, where a, a certain positional argument is ignored in every clause. If you have time, I can explain more about this later. This one is particularly opinionated, but if you work with um, if you follow the rules that I um, expressed in one of my articles, you can Google it, uh, or how to create Erlang, to define new Erlang behaviors. If you uh, follow the rule that you can do, that you only use the callbacks that you define within the module itself, uh, Han will be able to find if you have uh, excessive callback, callbacks, if you have callbacks that you don't use. If not, you can ignore this rule and that's it. But if you if you do, uh, uh, Hank will allow you to remove tons of code because if you if you have a callback that you are not using and if not if it's not optional, you can not only remove the callback, you can remove all the implementations of the callback, which is a good thing. And then there are these two, which are also opinionated, that basically allows you to. Uh, figure out if you have uh, stuff in your header files that can actually be placed on the modules that they that uh, where they where it's used, and so you don't uh, you don't have to look around for it if you if you need it. If you don't follow that practice, just ignore these two rules. If not, they are helpful. And of course, Han can also check your own rules. To that, you have to implement uh, you have to implement the Han rule behavior which consists of only two functions. One of them, you receive all the ASTs, the after syntax trees of all the files that are going to be analyzed, and you return a list of um, uh, Oxbow code instances with uh, each one of them with, uh, with an identifier. And on the other function, you match those identifiers with the ignore rules so that uh, you can, so that users can specify what, uh, results they don't want to see. Talking about specifying what to ignore, results that you don't want to see, Hank has a, a very detailed configuration option. In particular, you can put in your river config file a, a Hank entry with an ignore uh, configuration, and you can uh, remove, you can prevent Hank from emitting warnings about uh, entire folders or particular files or particular rules in particular folders or files or particular instances of particular rules in particular folders or files. So you can ignore whatever you want so that you can run Hank in your uh, continuous integration tools uh, or uh, uh, continuous integration pipelines and make sure that they emit no warnings. If you don't like to pollute your river config and write a long list here, you can uh, instead use the uh, Hank attribute in your modules and header files directly. And over there, you can put the same configuration or a similar configuration where you say, for instance, in this case, that uh, you don't want Hank to emit warnings about uh, any instance of a function or about uh, any argument of uh, the function, another function with RIT1, or about the first argument in the yet another function with RIT2. So very, very specific. 
or you can just ignore an, an entire rule in the file, or you can just ignore everything and Hank doesn't uh, analyze your file, that's fine. And then finally, let me talk about uh, accuracy. So when we started developing this thing, we had uh, like two paths. We could, we could either uh, generate a warning for everything that is uh, at least suspicious, and so let the user decide what to do with that. So something will tell you, maybe this thing you can remove it, check it out, or we can go uh, the other way where we, uh, whatever Hank says is right, and, uh, and we went the other way. Everybody knows that the ELISER is never wrong, particularly Stavros, and it might not report all the discrepancies, but if the ELISER says there is a problem there, there is a problem there. No questions. Something you need to fix. Okay, what we want from Hank is this. Hank will be never wrong, and it may not report every instance of Oxbow code. You may have dead codes laying around and Hank may not find it. But if Hank tells you that that thing is unused, that thing is unused. That means that if Hank tells you that that thing is unused and it's actually used, please report a bug to a repository so we can fix that thing, all right? And, uh, and final, my two final slides are aimed at convincing you that Hank is useful. And I will show you one thing, and I hope I gain, uh, I get at least your curiosity about this tool. We tried Hank with large code bases, open source code bases. We tried it with the largest and oldest one, which is Erlang OTP itself. We were expecting to find some unused things there, but we find many more, like way more unused stuff there than what we assumed what it was uh, going to, uh, to pop up. We found more than a thousand unused macros and more than 200 unused record fields. We even found configuration in an application uh, environment that it's not used anywhere. We also ran it on Kazoo. Kazoo is, a, is an open source uh, repository, an umbrella project that I generally use to test uh, Elvis because it's super large. It has, it, it, it has many, many, many modules. And we, as expected, also found a lot of things that uh, can be removed from it. And finally, we tested it in Mongoose.im. Mongoose.im is a project that I was part of when I worked at Erlang Solutions. And I personally can attest that it's very, very carefully maintained with very thorough code reviews and whatnot. And even then, even in a project that's maintained so thoroughly as, as that one, we still found seven unused record fields. So, of course, the disclaimer must be here, which is we just run Hank. We didn't analyze all those results to figure out if they are uh, valid or if they are due to, you know, idiosyncrasy on how to develop the code or dynamic stuff that we didn't anticipate or whatnot. But even so, even if this is reduced to a 10% of this, it's still a lot of things to remove. So I think that proves that this tool is worth it and that you can use it in your projects and you can extract a lot of uh, uh, valid stuff to do in, in, to fix or to improve your, your uh, maintenance. And so you should try it and let me know. That's all I have. Thank you very much. And in your way out, if you want to kill some dead code, that will help me a lot. Thank you very much, Brujo. And um, maybe you can show again the, the queue on how to enable, because we have uh, questions in the, in the chat, yes. people wanting to give it a try. Um, yes, let's go to, to questions. Uh, let's see, we have a question from Peter Yomori, uh, which is about, um, I don't know if Peter is here. No, I can read the question. Um, how far static analysis of source code can go in presence of uh, horrible creatures like macros, for example, defined command line, parse transforms, dynamicals, variables? Uh, yeah. Things that are used dynamically. So how far 
what are the, the what, yeah, what, what there, are, there are multiple limitations of what Han can find, uh, and then they are all re related to what Peter was uh, was expressing. Yeah, macros. Sometimes uh, some macro code is basically unparsable, and in that case, Han will not emit a warning where probably it should. But since we can't, we use the to, to be clear, we use uh, Erl syntax, uh, Erl parse, all the tools that comes with OTP. So if the OTP tools cannot read the code that, uh, that, that they find, uh, Hank will not emit a warning in those cases in general. Uh, then for stuff like uh, dynamic calls, it's a very complex subject and uh, we, uh, that applies mostly to the rule of unused parameters. And so uh, there is a ticket in, I think it's the last one in uh, OTP GitHub where, where we uh, are uh, suggesting a way of giving more information to Hank, uh, to Hank, no, so, so to provide more information in Erlang code about dynamic uh, callbacks. But uh, since it's not really there, what Hank does is if it finds a behavior that, that Hank doesn't know, stops analyzing the code because anything can be a callback. So we just don't check. And that's the same answer for basically everything. Uh, for the Erlang workshop in the ICFP, I submitted a paper uh, with the help of Laura Castro. Uh, to that, that describes most of these uh, stories, edge cases and whatnot, and it's under review. So hopefully we will be able to publish it eventually. And, uh, and you will see, you will be able to see all the different nuances. There are many, I can mm -hmm. tell you. But so far, every time what Hank uh, does is, okay, then we don't check. If we can't understand, we don't check and that's it. Mm -hmm. And this is also relevant to a question by Michael Peterson, which is, uh, it might be the case, for example, that you use a, a, a dynamically created module name, and then you can not find the uses of uh, where somebody is using something that you consider unused. So it's like the, the, the... yeah. When uh, in, in those, if you find, as I said in the slide, if you find a case where there is a, the hang is producing a warning that it should not produce. And it's not something that it's a matter of idiosyncrasy, like the callback thing, in which case I will always tell you, just ignore the rule. The rule is for people that use the callbacks in the same module where they are defined. But in other cases, just report the bug. We will deal with it in the, in the repo, in hand uh, repo. And most, uh, most likely, the first thing we will do will be to stop, stop emitting warnings there, until we have a proper solution for it. Mm -hmm. um, a question that you have partially already answered, but maybe it's good to have it in, in on the floor too. Uh, how about using this on Elixir? It's impossible. <laughs> it depends on. It, it it depends very very heavily on uh, on the code being written in Erlang because uh, maybe you can already get it from the slides, right? It uses uh, it detects unused record fields, which don't, or I'm not sure if they exist as such in Elixir. But in any case, to figure them out, it checks for attributes, uh, so it's complicated. It also uses the Erlang parser and the Erlang Erlang syntax tree and the Erlang whatever, all the tools that come with OTP. So so as it, as is, it's impossible. What can happen is that somebody thinks that this is a great idea and I'm totally up for, for a meeting with who, whatever Erla, any Erlang developer, Elixir developer willing to write uh, Elixir's hunk, I can help, no problem. Mm -hmm. And Pablo and Diego as well. <laughs> Excellent. Um, how about using this without a rebar? Is this possible? Is it, mm, <laughs> what's yeah. the, how many loops? Hoops does one have to jump through? Uh, no, no, it's basically impossible because, uh, for instance, to to understand where to find the configuration for the the, the different configuration options that that it has to check, it uses the 
River provided a list of applications okay. and other things. Huh? So it's very tightly coupled. Yeah, it's a, it's not it's not something like Elvis that you can run as a as a S script and you just have to properly specify the files. Sorry, but in this case, it's not not even so. Uh, it's like th there are many contextual things that are taken from uh, from River. In so theory, discussion. Hmm? in theory, you can the, the Hank module doesn't know anything about River. It receives everything as a context. So if you find another way to build a river context, you can use it, but it's not provided by the repo and it will not provide it anytime soon. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, uh, one more question on the, from the Q&A is, uh, how do you recommend using Hank in a pipeline before compilation? If there's some warning, stop the pipeline. What's the, what's the, what's the place that you recommend for Hank? Yeah, my, my usual approach, I generally uh, have a CI or test alias in my river config files. And they, you, can check the, you can check the open source project that, that we have in Nextrol, for instance, whatever, Spillway or River3 format. And uh, what we do is um, format verify lint uh, hank xref dialyzer uh, unit ct cover. Great. And are there other questions in, uh, from the people already attending? Please unmute yourselves and, uh, and go ahead and ask. Uh, there is no. I have a question about maybe it's more related to Elvis. So at our company, we have like common rule set for Elvis and, and which we use for many libraries. And where should we put it? Is it possible to put it in a common place and not replicate it in every, every web or config? We actually did something like that, but I but I don't remember exactly. You you will have to ping me on Slack and I can help. If it's particularly specifically about Elvis, you can also ping uh, Paulo. What's his name? Ferraz Oliveira. He he is uh, he, he's the one who was working with those rule sets and all those things. Great, thanks. I will check that out. More questions? Um, talking about, I have a question myself, talking about testing the limits of this, what about um, recursive functions and arguments where you have something that is passed all the way to the base case and not just there? Is uh, this... As long as you use it in one uh, function clause, it will be considered useful. Mm. Oh, I, I can give you an example of very, very so, fixed point uh, thinking, convoluted. Uh... Yeah, but <laughs> this is the thing. Uh, Hank will not detect uh, variables that are not used. And it will also not detect the fact that you use an, an, an ignore uh, variable. That, that's, those two things are for different tools. Like if you use an ignored variable, that's Elvis' job, not, mm -hmm. not Hank's job. Mm -hmm. Hank will assume that if you put an underscore or an underscore variable only without any other pattern in every single clause in the same uh, position and argument in every single clause of your function that uh, argument is unused so you have you have to really 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 unuse the uh, the uh, argument say. and it will also not check if uh, if the module implements a behavior ignore it if the if the module if, if the function calls nif error Ignore it. If uh, whatever, there, there are some other rules like that. We are mm -hmm. very strict on what we check, and we check few things, but uh, we check them everywhere. Which is good. All right, um, we are approaching the end of the session. Uh, I suggest that uh, you pick Brujo in the hallway track in Tucan. Um, so that uh, you can ask him and you can show him all of the things that Hank is finding in your projects and you don't like. And then he gets there to do a, the... For, I almost forgot. There is a River 3 Hank uh, room in the Slack, in the Erlang Slack. You can find me, Pablo, and Diego there. And we will be very happy to read all your warnings that you don't want and help you uh, reduce your anger against uh, Hank. <laughs>